It is, it is an extraordinary time to talk about the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, I want to try to provide you a perspective. Now, tonight I've been asked to speak for about 30 minutes and then uh, we'll have questions for about 30 minutes. And so in 30 minutes, I'm supposed to tell you what's going on in Egypt, Syria, Iran, the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, and what's also going to happen in the baseball <laughs> season as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove you I'm up to that challenge. I'm going to try to, I, I want to take a step back uh, and, and again, offer perspective to start with. Think about this. I've been in, I was in a political appointee to two Republican presidents and two Democratic presidents. Uh, I've been in, at a, at a non-political appointee position in a fifth administration. In none of the administrations that I worked with can I say that at any point did we confront anything like what the current administration, I was a member of the Obama administration uh, for three years, but if you look at what the Obama administration is facing in the Middle East, it's fair to say that none of its predecessors faced anything like this. It is true that in every one of those administrations I was a part of, a Middle Eastern issue became a very prominent part of foreign policy and national security. But it is not true that any administration had to contend with all of these challenges at the same time. Now, I'm not talking about what's going on in Europe or the emergence of China uh, or Russia trying to, in a sense, reestablish itself as a superpower. I'm talking only about what's happening in the Middle East. If it was only the challenge in Egypt, that would be enough to take up all the bandwidth, to use the current vernacular, of any administration. If it was only Syria, that would be enough. If it was only the Iranian nuclear challenge, that would be enough. Or if it was only the challenge of what Senator Secretary Kerry is trying to do in terms of recreate a real serious negotiating process between Israelis and Palestinians, that would be enough. But all these things are happening at the same time. Uh, and they are daunting, to say the least. You need to approach them with a very high degree of humility. Nobody predicted that we were going to see this kind of upheaval in the Middle East. So anybody who now comes in and says they can give you the exact prescription of what needs to be done, you should be extremely cautious uh, as you listen to them. You should retain a sense of skepticism, uh, but you should retain an open mind because we are not the authors of what's going on in the Middle East. You know, I, I will tell you, it's, um, it won't surprise you that having been our negotiator on Arab-Israeli issues during the Clinton administration, uh, it is often said that, you know, the reason we haven't achieved peace is because we failed. The U.S. failed. The last time I checked, it isn't the U.S. that has to make peace in the Middle East. It's the parties who have to make peace in the Middle East. The U.S. can help. The U.S. can play a role. Uh, and our stakes are such that we need to play a role. But we also have to retain, I think, as I said, a sense of humility. First, we didn't create this upheaval. We're not the source of it. And we're not going to be the salvation for it. But because we have real interest there, we have a stake in trying to affect it to the degree we can. Now, when Dan saw me a couple of weeks ago, he heard me uh, offer a an overview, a presentation of, uh, of the region. And that night, I didn't spend very much time on Egypt. I spent very little time on Egypt. Uh, he's saying to me, I spent no time on Egypt. <laughs> and that's probably not an exaggeration. Uh, so tonight, uh, what a surprise, I'm going to start with Egypt. But here again, I want to I put it in a perspective for you. The first thing you have to understand is that uh, the revolution in Egypt took place a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago now. I used to see Hosni Mubarak all the time when I was our negotiator. Now, my role typically then was to talk to him about the peace issues. 
But on, uh, on a number of occasions, uh, I would be asked to go in and raise our human rights concerns with him. And every time I would go in and I would raise those with him, he would tell me that I was naive. He would tell me I didn't understand the region. He would tell me that if he wasn't there, the Muslim Brotherhood would take over. So now, as some of you hear me say that, you say, gee, it turns out Hosni Mubarak was right. <laughs> right? Sounds like he was right. Now, the only problem with Hosni Mubarak was he made it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why did he make it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Because he made certain that there couldn't be any opposition to him that was credible. He wanted to create this binary reality where it was either him or it was this bogeyman, the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, he didn't have to turn them into a bogeyman. They are a bogeyman. But he made sure there wasn't a secular alternative to him. There wasn't a moderate alternative to him. No one could organize who might become a credible alternative. And while the Muslim Brotherhood was outlawed by him, he also allowed them to basically take over what were all the professional syndicates within Egypt. You had a lawyer syndicate dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. You had an engineer syndicate dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. You had a literary syndicate dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood was very effective in opposition because they had no responsibility. They could create a network of clinics so they would get credit for it. They could look like they embodied social justice, but they didn't have to provide for the society as a whole. They created, as I said, a credible posture in opposition. When the revolution came to Tyre Square, the Muslim Brotherhood was not out there in the street. It was the social media generation. It was the April 6th movement. The Muslim Brotherhood took advantage of it after the fact. In the Middle East, generally speaking, what we have seen is authoritarian regimes, non-monarchies, and maybe we'll get into that later. The only, by, I say this because you'll note the only regimes where you've seen this massive upheaval and you've seen the regime change has been in the non-monarchies. I'll let you ponder that and maybe you can ask me why that's the case later. In all of the non-monarchies where we've seen the upheaval, you had a, an authoritarian regime and when it was removed, when it was swept away, a vacuum was created. So who was going to fill that vacuum? The likely sources of filling that vacuum were the only organized forces that exist, the only ones who'd been allowed to organize. What was the one place, the one institution, that someone like Mubarak in Egypt or Ben Ali uh, in Tunisia couldn't take on? It was the mosque, right? It was the one source of real legitimacy and authenticity. And the one place where you were free to speak your mind, the one place from which you could organize was the mosque. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was created in the late 1920s. It was an underground movement for a long time, but it was allowed to surface, as I said, in these kind of independent vehicles. So it created an identity over time, it created connections to the half of Egypt that lives on $2 a day, and half the population lives on $2 a day. It connected to what is a conservative society religiously. It had an identity. It had an agenda. It came to embody social justice. It was organized. And when you had elections, which, again, were rushed, when you had elections, they were bound to win because the opposition that had produced Tyre Square, they could organize in social media, but there was no coherence. There was no political parties. They had to be created from scratch. They were all competitive, and many of the secular forces bore a stigma because the Mubarak regime had been secular. So when the elections took place, it was no surprise that the Muslim Brotherhood won. Now, I would say it to a lot of people, and I have said it over the last two years, don't assume this is the end of the story. And I would say it for a variety of reasons, but it boiled down to one. I said for 40 years, people in this part of the world, and certainly in Egypt, have had no voice. Now they've discovered their voice. And do you think after suddenly discovering their voice, they're going to give it up? And yet, the Muslim Brotherhood sought to govern as if they had 
They didn't have to pay attention to anybody's voice except their own. They created a new authoritarianism. What did President Morsi do? He issues a decree that denies any judicial oversight. He takes advantage of the Muslim Brotherhood Superior Organization to rough, rush through a referendum on a constitution that he allowed to be drafted only by Islamists. Under Morsi, you had more journalists prosecuted for insulting the president in one year than were prosecuted during all of Hosni Mubarak's time. Does this sound like these are Democrats? Hardly. They won an election and they thought they were anointed. They won an election and they thought they could control things and approach things in an exclusionary fashion. They didn't share power, they didn't include others, they would talk about a dialogue with the opposition, but it never materialized. And what you saw take place in Egypt, and I'm getting to, you know, let me put it this way, how many people here have heard there's a debate over was there a coup or wasn't there a coup? <laughs> now, most of the people in Egypt, you know what they say? They say there was a second revolution. That's what they say. Do you know that 14 million people turned out in the streets on June 30th? Is that of a population of 80 million people? Think about this country. If we had that percentage of our population turning out in the streets, can you imagine what that would mean? You know, you had, in a sense, the public decide they had no recourse. Now, the military is not a democratic institution in Egypt. And anybody who thinks that the military has intervened, and I'm choosing the word, they intervened. I'm a diplomat, so I choose my own terms. <laughs> they intervened. And the key at this point is what happens now. Now, the problem is the Muslim Brotherhood, particularly with the events of the day before yesterday where 51 people were killed. And it, it doesn't matter what triggered it. There's two different narratives, by the way, on what happened. The military says the Muslim Brotherhood opened fire. The Muslim Brotherhood says these were people engaged in prayer and they were peaceful. What we know is 51 people were killed. What we know is 300 people were wounded. And what we know is that the Muslim Brotherhood now is probably determined to continue to resist. And they represent an important part of the society. You, haven't, you basically have had the Egyptian public launch what amounts to the Second Revolution. The Second Revolution cannot be successful if it is also exclusionary. It can't be successful if the military is going to pull all the strings from behind the curtain. Somehow, some way, there's going to have to be a symbol of reconciliation. There's going to have to be some kind of conference or round table that brings together all the different elements of the society. And they're going to have to find a way to begin to work together and to share power. It's not going to work in Egypt otherwise. You know, it's not an accident that you saw the public come together because it wasn't just that the Muslim Brotherhood sought control over governance. And as a result, they now have neither. Neither control nor responsibility for governing. They didn't deal with the economy. The economy began to, uh, can only be described as having gone into free fall. You have to deal with the economy. And we as the United States do not have an interest in Egypt becoming a failed state. Now, as I, I said at the beginning, we didn't create this, we can't shape it, but we have a stake in what happens. Now, there's been debate over should we cut off assistance or not. I told Dan I would address this, so I'm, I'm a man of my word, I always do what I say. And it's, it's rare, by the way, that you'll see the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post on their editorial page all agree on something. In fact, I can't think of any other issue on which they all agree. But they are all saying that we should cut off 
assistance to the Egyptian military because by law, uh, if there is a coup uh, and a democratically elected government is, is supplanted by a coup, we are by law supposed to cut off assistance. Now you may have noted we haven't done that. Uh, and the administration has been very careful in terms of what it's saying. The president's statements have made it clear that we are concerned by what has happened, meaning that a, a government that was elected, a president who was elected, uh, has been displaced this way. But he, the, the president's statement also drew attention to what was happening in Egypt, the upheaval in Egypt, the response of the public. He said that he directed the relevant agencies to take a look at how we would approach the question of the assistance issue. But we have not dealt with this. We have, we have very clearly made a decision at this point. The administration has very clearly made a decision not at this point to cut off assistance. Uh, and I will tell you, I think it's the right decision. And the reason I think it's the right decision is not because I'm thrilled about what's happening in Egypt, but the minute we cut off assistance, we will lose any leverage we have. This is not the time for us to be focused on making statements adopting symbols. This is a time for us to think about how can we use the relationship we have with the military to get the military to do what are the right things in terms of creating the potential for sharing power, for creating a genuine constitutional process, for establishing elections in an appropriate time frame, for creating the kind of round table or vehicles for reconciliation that are going to be necessary. If we don't do that, all we will do is play to the polarization that exists within Egypt today. And it is profound, and it is deep, and it's not going to go away overnight. Anybody who's looking for a rapid turnaround in Egypt is kidding themselves. So this is one where we're going to have to have patience, we're going to have to do what we can from the outside, we're going to have to mobilize others on the outside so there is a consistent set of messages about the importance of creating a genuine constitution and creating a process of inclusion, not exclusion, uh, and leading to what will be elections over time so that Egypt has a chance to get back on a footing where all those in the society, one way or the other, are included and not excluded. So that's Egypt. And it reflects something deeper about the region. You know, what we're seeing in the Middle East is a transformation that has no direction at this point. The only thing we can say for sure is that we've known in the past is unlikely to be the reality in the future. The one thing we can say for sure is it's going to take time. There's a generational change that's underway and it will take a generation for it to play out. Meaning it isn't a new generation that comes to power, meaning it's going to take a generation to see what this story is going to be and how it's going to be written. And so we have to focus on where we have potential points of leverage. We have to focus on the resources we have available to try to influence it. We have to realize any exercise of statecraft reflects not just our objective and our means, but what are the means that we can mobilize with others? What's required here extends well beyond what we can do on our own. And we're going to have to take the long view on this, even while we shape a process, even while we shape a policy that recognizes the limits of, of our own power, but the fact that we have interests that matter there. Now, unfortunately, Egypt isn't the only challenge we're facing in this region right now. Syria, before Egypt erupted, uh, was the focal point of most recent attention. In fact, it was so prominent in the discussions that Iran and the Iranian nuclear issue somehow receded into the background. And I still want to be able to address that as well. But let me say a word about Syria. You know, if you look at Syria today, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost impossible to comprehend. I said, you know, imagine 14 million people turning out in the streets in Cairo. Well, imagine half the population of Syria being displaced, either within Syria or as refugees on the outside of Syria. Here's a country with a population of 21 million, 
or at least it had 21 million two years ago when the demonstrations began. You're talking about close to 11 million people, maybe more than half of the population of Syria, being displaced. At least 100,000 dead out of a population of 21 million. Registered refugees on the outside exceed 1.5 million, so you know the non-registered, those who aren't registered, are over and above that. And the rest are people who are displaced within Syria. And the UN, because of the way the UN is structured, provides humanitarian assistance almost exclusively through the regime. Do you think the regime provides any of that assistance to anybody who's living in the areas not controlled by the regime? Where do you think most of the people displaced are living? About half of probably 40 to 50 percent of the territory of Syria is not controlled by the Syrian government today. So you have a humanitarian disaster. If it were only a humanitarian disaster, we would still feel the need to do something. But it's not only a humanitarian disaster. The conflict in Syria does not operate according to the Las Vegas rules, meaning what's in Syria doesn't stay in Syria. <laughs> Yesterday there was a massive car bomb in Beirut, in the Hezbollah-controlled areas of Beirut. You look at the levels of violence in Iraq today, and they're back to 2008. They're not back to 2006 and 2007, but they're back to what they were in 2008. And the reason is because of Syria. The Iraqi Prime Minister, who was never excessively prone to including the Sunnis, now doesn't include them at all. The Sunnis, who up until about, I would say, a month ago, were still trying to work out political arrangements within Iraq so that they would get a piece of the pie. Today, they're not focused that way any longer. They're looking at Syria. They're seeing that there's going, in their minds, there's likely to be some kind of Sunni-based state in Syria. And they're thinking, okay, that can be the source of our returning ourselves to power within Iraq. So what takes place in Syria affects Lebanon. It affects Iraq. There are 540,000 refugees from Syria in Jordan. That is more than 10% of Jordan's whole population. Do you think that Jordan can absorb that? you think that doesn't have an effect on Jordan? Israel's longest border is with, guess who? Jordan. Today, the Israelis have announced they're creating a new division for the Golan Heights because they're anticipating what they may face in Syria. Syria, as we know it, may never exist again. It is true that Assad, with the help of Iran, and Hezbollah, it's not just Hezbollah, by the way. It's Hezbollah from Lebanon, and it's Qutayb Hezbollah, which is a Shiite militia from Iraq, the al haq which is also a Shiite militia from Iraq. They have become the shock troops for the Syrian forces uh, in the areas where they have been increasingly making gains. The gains they're making don't promise to have the regime, Bashar Assad's regime, take over the rest of Syria, they promise only to create a kind of enclave where the Alawis, who represent 12% of the population of Syria, may have a rump state. No one's admitting that, but that's where we're headed right now. Now the question is, what do we do? We have a humanitarian disaster, and we have a strategic disaster. We have in our foreign policy tradition two schools of thought for when the United States should intervene. One is idealist, and the other is realist. The idealist school of thought says, America should intervene only when our values are engaged. Only when there's a compelling moral reason for us to intervene. And the idealists look at Syria and say, there's a compelling moral reason for us to intervene. We're already looking at 100,000 dead, and the number's going to continue to go up. The realists look at Syria and they have no interest in moral interventions. They think moral interventions set the United States on moral binges that consume us, have us expend huge amounts of money and personnel, 
And they say we become even less capable of intervening where we need to because our concrete interests are involved. But even the realists look at Syria and they say, look, we can't afford to have Syria destabilize the whole Middle East. And that's where things are headed. So ironically, the idealists and the realists come together on Syria. I can tell you there's very few cases where that's true. And it's true there. But you also see that we have been hesitant to do much in Syria. There's a lot of different reasons why we've been hesitant. One reason is that the opposition itself is completely fractured. Related to that, those within the opposition today who have the upper hand are radical Islamists. We as a country have fought wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. You go back over the last 10 to 12 years, we've spent a couple trillion dollars. We've lost probably 7,000 dead, maybe 50,000 wounded. We are both weary and wary about getting involved in other conflicts in the Middle East. It is completely understandable. You don't see a groundswell of support from Republicans or Democrats in Congress saying, go do a lot more in Syria. You don't see that. Even though what I just described was idealists and realists come together on our stakes there. The president made a decision after this, the Syrian government's use of chemical weapons that we would begin to provide lethal assistance. Because the Syrians cross the threshold, therefore we will cross the threshold. The real question I think we need to ask ourselves about Syria is, what should our objective be? Should our objective be to try to change the balance of power in Syria, both between the opposition and the regime and within the opposition itself? And the aim of changing the balance of power would be to try to preserve Syria and to create circumstances where at some point you can actually produce a political process that yields a, a negotiated outcome? That could be one objective. But if that's our objective, the means we have to apply to it have to be different than we're currently applying. It isn't just that we would provide some lethal assistance. It would be that we would manage the whole effort of providing assistance. Not that we would provide it all, but we would manage it. We would have a senior official, maybe a four-star general. After the president spoke to all the different countries that are providing disparate sources of assistance today, arms, and other sources of assistance, but it all goes in different directions. Someone needs to, to manage that effort, mobilize that effort, run that effort, identify those within the opposition we're prepared to support, and that requires a significant investment, at least of political capital. That would be one objective, but it would be an objective. There's a different objective. If we're not prepared to be engaged that way, and that engagement doesn't require American forces, but it does require an active American role to organize the kind of support that needs to be provided to the opposition, again, with a degree of patience, because it's not going to turn around things overnight, but it requires the president speaking to his counterparts and saying, we will now run the effort, we'll create a division of labor, where all of us who are providing things will be done in a way that complements the effort. Each of us who does something will provide something that adds to it. Not having parallel efforts that don't connect, that aren't complementary, that would be one approach. But it requires a significant investment on our part, at least of political capital. If we're not prepared to do that, there's another alternative. It would be an alternative of containment. The problem with containment is that basically it bets on the fragmentation of Syria, but its aim is to keep the fighting in Syria itself. Now when you say that, it means the human toll that we've already seen is going to get worse, but it means the conflict doesn't radiate outwards and destabilize every country around it. Now even a containment objective won't be cost-free. It means investing in buffers within Syria itself. It means focusing on the reality that you have lots of localized leaderships within Syria, and rather than thinking about trying to somehow get them to cohere, you don't focus on that. You focus, in a sense, on letting the fragmentation of Syria take its course, but building buffers in the south, in the north, and the east 
Invest in those local leaderships so that people don't leave. And that means invest economically, and that means getting into countries like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, uh, who have the money and who want Jordan to be a buffer so the conflict doesn't spread towards them. Getting them to invest in those buffers, but it also means you're going to have to create safe areas. If people, it's not just that people will be able to live there from an economic standpoint and function, it's that they have to be safe enough to be able to live there so they won't leave. And that some of the refugees will choose to go back. Now, if you're going to create safe areas, what does that require? It requires, at a minimum, no-fly areas so that the Syrian air forces can't continue to bomb with a kind of impunity. Now, does that mean that we have to then create no-flies where the U.S. has air forces there creating the no-fly? No. These areas along the borders, these buffers, can be created by using Patriot missiles. We have Patriot missiles today on the, as part of NATO. Uh, the Turkish-Syrian border, they have a range of 50 miles. That encompasses a city like Aleppo. And you could simply declare any plane flying within 50 miles of the border will be deemed to have hostile intent. And you use the Patriot missiles to ensure that the Syrian Air Force can't operate in those areas. We have put Patriot missiles now into Jordan. You do the same thing down there. Containment as an objective is not cost-free either. I raise these two as objectives because I'm saying if we don't have one of these kinds of objectives, we're going to find we get sucked in anyway. The more this conflict radiates out, the more we'll get drawn in at some point. It is fair to say there are no good options in Syria. Anybody tells you there's a good option in Syria and everything's going to be fine, you know, they're kidding themselves or they're, or they're kidding you. There are no good options in Syria. But the option of staying on the path we're on may be the worst option. So something has to change. All right, Iran. Because Iran has invested heavily in Syria. And there was, as you may have noted, a recent election within Iran. Now, the interesting thing about this election, first of all, you have to understand that you had a very limited number of candidates. Anyone who was really not part of the establishment was not permitted to run. That wasn't what was interesting about the election. What was interesting about the election was the one person who ran, who was very close to the Supreme Leader, Hassan Rouhani, very close to the Supreme Leader, a cleric, he was the one person who ran against Iran's international isolation, the policies that produced it, ran against the policies that produced sanctions, and promised to change it. Talk about a wound with the United States that needs to be somehow healed. He ran against the status quo, and he won. Now, the interesting thing, and I ask myself this question, why did the Supreme Leader let him win? Think about it. He didn't have to let him win. In 2009, they cooked the election. Rouhani got 50.5% of the vote. If you didn't want him to win, you can, you, you, he didn't have to rig the whole election. <laughs> All he had to do was make sure he got less than 50% so there'd be a runoff. He let him win. Why did he let him win? What does it tell us? You know, whenever something happens that's not expected, you have to ask yourself questions. What's one of the, the big problems in foreign policy making in every administration? And I've been in five different administrations, and I can tell you one of the, one of the things that is always a problem in any administration is a tendency not to ask questions about your own assumptions, number one. And number two, to create a groupthink. And whenever there's a groupthink, I can assure you that it's not good for effective policymaking. So at this point, I think it's important to ask the question, why would the Supreme Leader let Rouhani win? Now, I have several explanations for why he let him win. One is he actually understands how the sanctions are affecting not just the Iranian economy, but the psychology of the Iranian people. And he understood that there is deep alienation within the country. And so one explanation could be he let him win because he creates a moderate face who can create a sense of possibility and hope 
And this is a way to release some of the tension. That could be one explanation. A second explanation could be he creates a moderate face and on the outside we and others will say, all right, look, we've got to give diplomacy a chance. Continue to give it a chance. We've given it a chance for a long time. We've got to continue to give it a chance. Another possibility is that Rouhani is a cleric and he wanted to create, he wanted to restore the power of the clerics against the Revolutionary Guard. By the way, none of these explanations are mutually exclusive. They can all be part of why he chose to do it, including one other explanation that can cut in two different ways. That he wanted a moderate face so he could continue the nuclear program, but he could do it under the, the guise of, of having diplomacy continue. Or he's going to allow someone like Rouhani, who, by the way, in 2003, 2004, when he was the negotiator, he produced a suspension in their enrichment approach. He could be allowing Rouhani to see if he can do a deal with us on the nuclear program. Uh, and he, Rouhani brings him back a deal, and if he finds it acceptable, he accepts it. If he doesn't find it acceptable, he doesn't accept it. What does it mean for us? Basically what it means for us is the following. We should test the possibility that there could be a deal there. But it's time for us again to change the character of our diplomacy. We have pursued what's known as a step-by-step -step approach to see if, we would, if they would take a step, we would take a step. The problem with the step-by-step -step approach is it has produced absolutely nothing except one thing. It has produced 17,000 centrifuges on the Iranian side. It has also produced severe economic sanctions, which, by the way, is the reason Rouhani got elected. So it's not that the step-by-step -step approach in our diplomacy has produced nothing. We produced sanctions on the one hand, but we didn't change, we didn't succeed in changing the Iranian nuclear program. So when I say we have to test Rouhani, we have to test it not in a step-by-step -step way. It's time for us to put on the table an endgame proposal. You know, when you do diplomacy, the key to diplomacy often boils down to two items. One, take away excuses. In diplomacy, you're often dealing with those who say they can't do something because. Take away their because. Take away their excuse. In the Iranian case, they say, we don't know what you're prepared to accept in terms of our nuclear program. So we should put a proposal on the table that takes that excuse away, but it's saying you can have civil nuclear power. Here's a proposal that allows you to have civil nuclear power, but it's going to be restricted in a way that prevents you from turning civil nuclear power into nuclear weapons. And it's going to have transparency and verification mechanisms that will allow us to have high confidence that those restrictions will be lived up to. And it will be close to impossible for you to get away with cheating. So put a proposal on the table that allows the Iranians to have civil nuclear power, but with restrictions and with the kind of extensive verification mechanisms, which will have to be very intrusive, that will allow us to satisfy ourselves that those restrictions, in fact, can be verified. The reason we need to do that is because the Iranian nuclear program is proceeding apace. They don't just have 17,000 centrifuges now. They have a new generation of centrifuges, which are four times as efficient as the centrifuges they've been installing up until now. It took them 10 years to overcome the technical difficulties, but they've overcome them. So not only are they moving ahead with a nuclear program, on the one hand, but they also are building a heavy water plant, which they've been building for some time. And the reason I mention that is there's two ways for you to build a nuclear weapon. One way is to enrich uranium to weapons grade and create a weapons core out of the weapons grade uranium that you've enriched. Another way is to separate plutonium from heavy water and create a plutonium bomb. The Iranians right now are putting themselves in a position that within a year, 18 months, they may be able to move in either one of those directions. Now something has to give, because the President of the United States adopted an objective of prevention not containment. He didn't adopt an objective and said, you know what, we can't stop him, therefore we'll live with it, but we'll contain him and we'll deter him. He didn't adopt that. He adopted an objective of prevention. He said we can't afford for them to have that kind of a capability. Why? Because containment won't stop the Saudis. 
from getting nuclear weapons. If Iran has it, Saudi Arabia's going to have it. If Saudi Arabia's going to have it, then Turkey's going to have it. And suddenly you're going to have a Middle East that is nuclear armed. And the Middle East that is nuclear armed isn't going to be run by the rules that we saw in the Cold War, which, by the way, weren't so foolproof. We were a lot closer to nuclear war with the Soviets a couple times than anybody knew. In the Middle East, where nobody will feel that they can afford to strike second, where everybody will have their finger on the trigger, and where conflict is the norm, not the exception, if the Middle East becomes a nuclear-armed region, we will have a war, a nuclear war in the Middle East. And that's why the president made the decision, we can't afford containment. But if diplomacy doesn't work, what are you left with? You end up using force. We need to clarify the situation. The election in Iran created a new circumstance. It should be tested. It should be tested with an endgame proposal, and we should clarify the situation. All right, I know I've gone beyond my 30 minutes. I know actually, even though Dan says there isn't, I know there is a trap door up here. <laughs> I know if I continue to, do, continue to go on without taking questions, that trap door is going to open up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. I'm going to take questions. It is true I haven't dealt with the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and I'm congenitally incapable of not dealing with it. So whether you ask me that question or not, I will address it. But let's turn to questions. Ambassador Ross, thank you for that tremendous overview of three of the 22 countries in the Middle East. At this point, we have two options. Number one, to ask them to address the circumstances of the other 19. And we'd ask everyone to get very comfortable of breakfast and lunch brought in uh, for him to finish. And the second, as he suggested, is, is to has, have questions. As you can see here, we have two microphones at the front. And so we'll ask for those of you who have questions to approach one microphone or the other. One of you approach, once you've approached that microphone, we'd ask you, number one, uh, to tell us your name. And then second, um, if you do have comments or opinions of your own about the Middle East, we'd ask that you hold off on expressing those until after the formal program, at which point my brother Jonathan would be more than happy to listen to, you, to your heart's content. <laughs> um, but we'd ask that with this question time, we leave as much time as possible for the ambassador to answer questions and so that the questions have question marks at the conclusion of them. Um, with that, we'll ask anyone who'd like to come uh, to one of the microphones, and we'll leave as much time as possible for as many of you as possible to ask questions. While people are coming to the mic, I'll start out by asking you, Dennis, the first one. Dennis, do you have any thoughts on the Israeli-Palestinian situation that you'd like to share? <laughs> Dan, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> you know, I was, um, I've been asked several times recently, including when I was in Israel, um, a week or so ago, uh, why did I think that Secretary Kerry was making such an effort between Israelis and Palestinians at a time when Egypt is now uh, in a state of uh, suspended upheaval, uh, Syria is in a state of, uh, you know, just unbelievable brutal civil war, uh, and the Iranian nuclear program continues apace. Why was he making such an effort here? And I, I gave the following answer. You're sitting in Jerusalem, and what do you face in Egypt? Enormous upheaval. What do you face to the north in Syria? Enormous upheaval spilling over into Lebanon. Uh, everywhere you look right now, you have instability, uncertainty, and the potential for worse turmoil, except one place. Right now you have one stable front. You don't have peace with the Palestinians, but it's stable. If you do nothing on this, sooner or later you're likely to see the upheaval come there too. And maybe you'll see the Palestinian Authority actually collapse. And the one thing we know in the Middle East is when there's a vacuum, it is always filled. And it's never filled by the forces you want to fill it. So either Israel will have to fill the vacuum, which means it has to assume the whole burden of the West Bank, or Hamas is likely to fill the vacuum. And from a strategic standpoint, it's profoundly in Israel's interest, but also profoundly in America's interest, uh, 
and I would say profoundly in Palestinian interest if they want to have a state at some point, that you, stab you stabilize that front. And so that's why I think Secretary Kerry is doing what he's doing. Now the question is, what's different this time? And the answer is, well, not a lot. But think about the following. You know, the turmoil all around the Israelis and Palestinians has created a chilling effect uh, on both. But it also, paradoxically, creates an opportunity. Because everyone around them is completely preoccupied with themselves. And they're going to be preoccupied for some time to come. Which means those who otherwise would be, who could trigger a backlash against any deal, are going to be pretty much internally consumed. So there is, ironically, a political space to try to do something. And there is a reason to try to do something. Now, I um, I have made a suggestion. I wrote a, a piece in the New York Times a couple of months ago where I tried to say, look, it's important to create a basis for negotiations, but the bigger problem between the two sides right now is disbelief. Israelis do not believe that Palestinians are committed to two states. Israelis look at the Palestinians and say, when they talk two states, what they mean is a Palestinian state and a binational state, not the Jewish state of Israel. And Palestinians look at Israelis and say, they don't believe in two states. If they believe in two states, why would they be building in what should be our state? And why do they control our lives the way they do? So each are governed by disbelief, made more likely by the fact that we are in the 20th year since Oslo began. And if you're going to make something happen, if you resume negotiations, you have to show this time something is different, given the scope of disbelief. The context of disbelief is bound to affect both leaders. So my suggestion was, yes, you have a basis for negotiations that deals with the core issues, but you need to do something else. You should create an agenda for discussion at the beginning of those negotiations that focuses on addressing each side's disbelief about the other. And I won't right now run through my 16-point proposal, which actually is 16 points, but I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Uh, on, the, on the Israeli side, the, the perception of the Palestinians is basically related to psychology. On the Palestinian side, it's basically related to specific things that the Israelis do. So to address the Palestinian sources of disbelief about the Israelis, I would have the Israelis, and this should be, again, an agenda for discussion. I don't believe in unilateral steps. The only thing unilateral steps have produced is more unilateralism, and it's been destructive, not constructive. So this should be an agenda for discussions. And if one side is prepared to take certain steps, the other side needs to be prepared to take steps too. So what the Israelis could do as an example, two examples out of my 16, the Israelis could build only in the blocks, not outside the blocks. The sediment blocks take up about a little less than 8% of the West Bank, which means if you're building there, you're not building in 92% of the West Bank. Now, the Palestinians don't agree on the size of the sediment blocks, but that's what you should negotiate. If you're going to do borders, you're going to have to negotiate what the size of the blocks is. The minute the Israelis do this, they can say, we're building only in what we think should be part of Israel, but that's also negotiable in terms of the size of those blocks. So one thing the Israelis could do is build only in the sediment blocks. The second thing they could do is the, the West Bank is divided into three areas, A, B, and C. It's a function of the interim agreement. Uh, the C area is where the Israelis retain civil and security control, and it represents 60.1% of the West Bank. Today, the Palestinians can do very little in that 60.1%. I say open up the 60.1% to economic activity by the Palestinians. Israelis retain the security control, but allow the Palestinians to economically begin to have projects in a significant way in the 60.1%. Not only will it be good economically for the Palestinians, and they need that kind of help. But it also sends a message. If building only the block says, well, you know what, we're not going to build in what is part of your state, or you know, what we think will be your state, 
And, the, and building and allowing economic activity, activity in Area C sends a message that, look, we don't, when we say we don't want to control your lives, we don't want to control your lives, so we're going to open up in a way that doesn't create security problems. So there's two examples of what the Israelis could do to address the sources of Palestinian disbelief. Two examples of what the Palestinians could do to address the Israeli sources of disbelief. Put Israel on a map. <laughs> Pretty damn hard to convince the Israeli public that the Palestinians are serious about two states if the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority doesn't have a map that shows Israel. Pretty hard to do that. A second thing, talk about two states for two peoples. Say there are two national movements, two national identities, the reason we're talking about two states for two peoples is because there's these two national movements. There's two examples on each side designed to address the sources of disbelief. As I said, I actually have 16, but I gave you only four. All right, next question. I think you spoke how Israel can exist with, uh, in a tough neighborhood. How can Israel convince Russia not to sell, give anti-aircraft equipment to Iran? And Israel is Israel serious about attacking Iran to eliminate the nuclear threat? Well, everybody hear the question? Understand the question? All right. The question was, I think, well, I know what the question was, and I'm going to tell you what I think you wanted to ask. <laughs> I think what you wanted to ask was, um, not Iran right now, this, the Russians are not selling anti-air equipment to the Iranians. They actually canceled the S-300 to the Iranians. The S-300 is a, a long-range anti-aircraft system that can engage aircraft out to 150, 200 miles away. Uh, and uh, they, had, they had a contract with the Iranians. The Israelis made requests. We made requests. And then after the Security Council Resolu Resolution 1929 was passed, in June of 2010, the Russians explicitly canceled that contract and are not providing it. So they're not providing arms to the Iranians. I think you're focused on Syria, not Iran, where the Russians are providing arms and where the Russians have said that they would provide the S-300 to the Syrians. Now, the S-300, if it were in the hands of the Syrians, could actually engage Israeli aircraft flying in Israel. And the Israelis have, have, have created a red line uh, as it relates to Syria, which they have acted on on a number of occasions, where they said any qualitatively new weapons transferred to Hezbollah in Lebanon, Israel will stop. They will prevent. And on three occasions, they've done that. Now, the Israelis have asked the Russians not to provide the S-300, and the way they've asked in private has implied that Israel cannot afford to allow the S-300 to get into Syrian hands. And I suspect that what the Israelis mean by that is that they will do, if those uh, weapons begin to appear, and again, they have to, if they get shipped there, they get shipped there, and they don't get shipped in, you know, in, in, a, in a way where the weapon system is suddenly it just materializes and it's there. It comes in parts, it has to be assembled, and so forth. And I suspect what the Israelis are saying is they will simply not allow the S-300 to be deployed uh, to Syria. And the Russians will have to think pretty hard about do they want to find out what that means in practice. Uh, if there's one thing I think very few people question is when the Israelis establish a red line, they actually seem to act on it. I have a different question concerning the United Nations. And my understanding is that there are really two definitions for refugees by the United Nations. Uh, and the uh, UNRWA uh, has actually become a uh, entity into, in and of itself uh, supporting the so-called Palestinian refugees, but we're dealing here with second and third generations who they're calling refugees. And there was a recent comment uh, on NPR that with all of the refugees coming from Syria, 
into Jordan and into uh, uh, Lebanon that it's the worst refugee crisis in over 20 years. How do you deal with the UN in trying to deal with these different definitions of refugees and the, and the institution that they've created that has become pro-Palestinian? Well, I don't see the UN as being the forum or mechanism for settling the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, it can bless an agreement, but it's not the forum for it. I think the issue of refugees uh, is going to have to be resolved in a negotiation between Israelis and Palestinians. I think when it is resolved, then UNRWA as an institution will go away and won't exist any longer. Uh, and I think the, the question of trying to deal with these kinds of definitions is, uh, you know, is something that we can engage in a kind of discussion on, but it won't change one iota the realities. So if one wants to deal with the question of refugees, it isn't, you don't deal with it by dealing with UNRWA. You deal with it by seeing if there is going to be a real negotiation between Israelis and Palestinians where this issue has to be resolved. Uh, and it's going to have to be resolved in a way that also is consistent with a two-state outcome. So, um, you know, I really don't have a better answer than that. But I think the real issue here is to focus on this is one of the, one of the core issues that has to be resolved between Israelis and Palestinians and the UN isn't going to be where it's resolved. Mr. Ross, I'd like to ask you how you see the events in Egypt and the events in Syria playing themselves out in regard to Israel, because both are very volatile. I understand it was reported in the press that Israel asked the United States not to discontinue the aid to Egypt. So how does this all play out, Egypt and Syria, in regards to Israel? And thank you for answering. Well, at least you asked me a simple question. <laughs> you know, I think I was trying to convey the notion that nobody can tell you how this is going to play out at this point. What you can identify is what are the realities right now, what are the, the issues one has to contend with. Clearly, what's the big source of concern the Israelis will have vis-a-vis -vis the Egyptians? It is not just the existence and maintenance of the treaty, which clearly the Egyptian military has been committed to. It's also what happens in the Sinai. The Sinai has been this kind of no man's land. Uh, you know, the you have uh, you have Al Qaeda groups in the Sinai now, uh, and at some point, you know, the what they represent is they represent. And it's clear they don't represent just a threat to Israel, they represent a threat to Egypt. Uh, and of late, they've been attacking Egyptians. So I think the, from an Israeli standpoint, you know, the, um, I think the Israelis will, will probably be quite open to, uh, to granting exceptions to the treaty so that the Egyptians can act, can operate militarily within the Sinai to deal with what is a threat to both countries. Egypt, if it, you know, Egypt, the Sinai is part of Egypt and they have not only a need but an interest in ensuring they have sovereignty over it and that at some point they restore law and order. But the fact is, to deal with the problems in the Sinai, which is also characterized by lots of different tribes, you're going to also have to pay some attention to the Sinai. And I don't just mean from a military standpoint, I mean from an economic development standpoint. The people in the Sinai have to feel that the government in Cairo has a stake in them, which is certainly throughout Mubarak's period, that was simply not true. So, you know, the way I think the, the more immediate problems the Israelis are going to be concerned about is what goes on in the Sinai. Will there be threats out of the Sinai, potential threats of terror out of the Sinai? And will the Egyptian military actually deal with this at a time when they're also having to deal with broader stability within the society as a whole? But I think that's one of the things to watch. Um, and clearly it's one of the things that from a standpoint of, again, if the U.S. cuts off assistance 
to Egypt. You think it makes it more likely the military does things we would like to see them do? You lose all your leverage, including on things that relate to the Sinai. And so it's another reason why I feel strongly it would be a mistake to cut off the assistance, and I'm glad we haven't done it. You know, Syria, I talked about what's already happening, that Israel is now creating a new division to contend with um, potential sources of instability coming out of Syria. The problem in Syria is that there's no easy resolution anytime soon. Uh, and, you know, the fact is, the more fragmented Syria becomes, the more the potential for al-Qaeda-type groups to embed themselves there. And here again, that's the reason that I think one way or the other, either our objective needs to be we are going to adopt a posture where we will actively try to change the balance of power, not because of what we do on our own, but how we help to manage what will be the overall assistance effort, which means money, arms, training. And training means identifying those in the opposition who are committed to a non-sectarian, inclusive Syria, uh, and training them in terms of what it takes to be able to operate, providing them the kinds of weapons that are relevant. By the way, suddenly giving them all sorts of sophisticated weapons that they can't use, that's not relevant. That doesn't help. But one option has to be that you try to change the balance of power. The other option has to be you go for a containment strategy. But I think we need to have objectives that are, that are clear one way or the other. Uh, and just like I'm saying when it comes to the Iranian nuclear program, we need to clarify you know, what an end game, clarify the situation. I think also in Syria, the sooner we kind of clarify what, we're, what we are going to try to get done, which is not the same as saying we want a political process, Political process or Assad leaving isn't just going to materialize on its own. You have to employ the means that make it more likely, understanding it's going to take time and it's not going to be an easy or quick turnaround. Clearly, the Israelis have established for themselves their own red lines that they will act if they think those red lines are breached. What are those red lines? I've already mentioned those red lines as they re relate to Hezbollah. There's a red line as it relates to chemical weapons falling into the... Into uh, hands that could be prepared to use them against the Israelis or others. Um, I'm Alex. I'm a student here at EWM. I want to start off by thanking you for coming here this evening. I really enjoyed your insights. Um, I noticed you didn't get a chance to touch on Turkey, really. Um, I'd just like to hear your general thoughts on the protests going on there, and I guess specifically um, your opinion on the authenticity and legitimacy of the regime. Thank you. Um, as Dan said, there were quite a few countries I didn't touch on. Uh, and it is true that uh, if I decide to go down this road, we will be serving breakfast soon. Uh, on Turkey, um, I put Turkey in a somewhat different category than what we're seeing. Yes, we've seen the demonstrations. I think the demonstrations are significant. Uh, I think what they reflect is a frustration within the society about um, the Turkish government having become a kind of majoritarian. Yes, Prime Minister Erdogan has won three elections, and each election he's won, he's won by a progressively larger margin. So he has very clear support of about half the country. Uh, but I think that what began to happen in this past year that produced this kind of reaction was a sense that he was beginning to move from focusing on political issues and economic issues into social mores. So suddenly he was talking about limiting you know, the amount of alcohol that one could consume. Uh, and there began to be more of a sense that he was going to be imposing you know, additional intrusions into the way people live. And I think that's what helped to produce the reaction. Uh, whether it's a wake-up call for him, it should be. Because I think within Turkey now, there's much more political awareness. It hasn't yet been translated into the political parties. And that means that you have a society that is much more mobilized than it's been before, a society that's much more prepared to express itself on political issues than it's been before. And at some point, that'll have to translate through political parties, which it has not yet done. <coughs> 
But I do think that it is a, it, it means that there will be, um, I think, some greater constraints on what the Turkish government can do. And I think it's important that it learns the lessons from this. We've seen mixed pictures in this regard. I mean, it's really mixed messages. Some signs of understanding was taking place and some responsiveness. Other signs that's not the case. But, for example, the, the park that was basically going to be um, replaced by barracks uh, and, uh, and a new shopping mall, that hasn't happened. And the government has respected a, an administrative court's decision uh, to put all that on hold. So there are signs that there's, uh, you know, that uh, Erdogan and those around him are not impervious to this. But I think, um, you know, this was a signal that within that society, if you begin to push farther into the social mores questions, you're going to produce more of a backlash. While he still has, I think, significant support in the countryside and among the kind of conservative base that he's always had, uh, I think that there's a, you know, this is not just the urban elite that was reacting, it's broader than that. Thank you. Uh, my name's Dave Luck. <clears throat> you laid out several options for Syria that the United States could implement if it uh, exercised some pretty courageous leadership. Uh, this morning we read that the UAE and Saudi Arabia are going to pour billions of dollars into Egypt. Uh, my question for you is, uh, by foregoing our leadership role in the Middle East, are we by default allowing uh, the Wahhabist uh, ideology to be perpetrated on the Egyptian people going forward? Well, there's a couple of, there's a kind of two premises in your question. One is that we are foregoing a leadership role, and two, that what the Saudis want to do is sort of export Wahhabism to Egypt. Let me take the second question first, or second point first. I think that's not what the Saudis are doing. The Saudis uh, very much were opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, one might think, why would the Saudis oppose the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, because it's a competing truth. Uh, and, uh, and there was a time when the Saudis and the Muslim Brotherhood were very close, but over time that changed. Uh, and they, I think the Saudis see the Muslim Brotherhood very much as a threat. And certainly the UAE does, because the UAE now is, uh, has been in, imprisoning members of the Muslim Brotherhood, and there's trials there. They've been accused of trying to subvert the government. So both Saudi Arabia and the UAE are very focused on, uh, on not seeing a rise of the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the region. And by the way, you know, for all those who are saying the wave of the future is the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam, uh, just as I said before, not so fast, not so fast on this. I would say the, the Saudis will probably go along with uh, any political process that restores stability to Egypt uh, and that promises uh, to, to have you know, someone other than the Muslim Brotherhood basically running Egypt. Today, even though the Muslim Brotherhood still has organization and the like, they produce this backlash in Egypt. And if the Muslim Brotherhood now, if they decide that their reaction to what the military has done is violence, I think they'll produce a bigger backlash against them within the country. So the Muslim Brotherhood also has some choices to make. The, I think the, the new interim civilian government is saying the right things, but I think there has to be a political process where the Muslim Brotherhood can also participate. They are a social force. They can't be dismissed. And if everything is going to be split between the secularists and the Islamists, that's a prescription for a very long conflict. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to reconcile the differences. It's not going to be easy to reconcile the differences. But I think you're going to have to have a process that is inclusive. The reason President Morsi... Uh, produce this backlash of a majority of the country is precisely because they saw uh, the Muslim Brotherhood acting as if they could impose on everyone else and no one else mattered. I think the, the Saudis basically, what they want to see in Egypt is not Wahhabism. What the Saudis want to see in Egypt uh, is a leadership that is not the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Uh, and my guess is they'll accept quite a, quite a lot. I mean, they're probably not troubled by seeing the military if the military could be running things, but the military doesn't want to run things. They want the civilians back in power. They don't want to bear that responsibility. They know they can't do it. So that's, a, that's a, on the second point. On the first point, um, you know, I, I think the, the notion of American leadership is real around the world and their expectations about what we'll do. Uh, and the truth is everyone is always looking to us first. It's just the way it is. Now, part of the reason they look to us is not only because we've had the power, but part of it is because generally around the world, we are seen as being more selfless. Now, that's not the case in Egypt today, by the way. Right now, we're blamed by both sides. Uh, the opposition, the people who were in the streets, felt that we were backing the Muslim Brotherhood. That's what they believed. That's why you saw pictures of the president and our ambassador exed out. Uh, now the Muslim Brotherhood, because we're not out there saying there's a coup and cutting off assistance, they say, ah, we're, you know, we're part of the conspiracy against them. So in Egypt, it's going to take a while before we will reestablish that image of selflessness. But as a general rule of thumb, that's the way we're perceived. One of the, you know, there's a lot of, if you go into the Syrian refugee camps right now, even though the Russians back Assad and provide them arms and so forth, they're not mad at the Russians because they don't expect anything from the Russians. They expect something from us because we do embody a set of values. And that is a reason there are expectations about us. Uh, and here's where we have, to, we have to try to reconcile what I was describing earlier. There are very good reasons why there's a sense of wariness and weariness on our part. <laughs> there are profoundly good reasons. And what we have to do is we have to wrestle with What's the kind of role that we can play right now that is consistent with the role that we think we can play and that we can sustain, given everything that we have done? The reason I favor a more active approach than maybe some others is because I think we look at a region that is characterized by all sorts of pathologies. And what I'm convinced of is those pathologies, if we're not there, won't stay there. Sooner or later, they will visit us. When I talk about the fragmentation of Syria, uh, I think about not just the fallout around Syria, I think about what happens if at some point the chemical weapons do fall in different hands. Uh, I think about the possibility of Al-Qaeda embedding itself in part of Syria for the long haul. They will not just threaten the neighbors. They sooner or later will threaten us as well. So I feel that there is a need for us to take a certain kind of active posture. It isn't an active posture that is without limitations. It isn't an active posture where it's only us on our own acting. It's an active posture where we use our activity to mobilize others so there's a collective response. We cannot do this unilaterally, but we can do it in a way where there's a serious division of labor, but I'm not sure you produce that division of labor unless the U.S takes a kind of active role that produces the more meaningful responses. Hi, my name is Matt, and I want to thank you for your time. Uh, my question is back to Jeremy Scahill's Dirty Wars, recent documentary and book that came out. In the book, he highlights America's large drone program and covert operations throughout the Middle East. I'm just wanting your opinion on how we can continue to preach a peace in the Middle East while our own programs are causing innocent civilians to turn into violent extremists that are out to get us? Um, well, again, I don't know that, that uh, I'm kind of, the premise of your question is, if we didn't do certain things, there wouldn't be violent extremists there. And I'm afraid there would be violent extremists there. The question is, can we do smarter things so that our own behavior doesn't produce more of what we don't want to see, but the idea that somehow if we just didn't, you know, if we didn't have certain kinds of programs, we wouldn't face, Al-Qaeda wouldn't exist, it's just not the case. I mean, you go back and you look at the, the, the intellectual godfather of Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda movement was a man called 
uh, Sayyid Qutayb. He was actually uh, hung by Nasser in 1966. He spent a couple years in the United States uh, after the Second World War. And he saw in us an ideology whose mere existence was a threat to Islam, the way he defined Islam. And his definition of Islam was narrow, intolerant, uh, intolerant of others who didn't practice Islam the way he interpreted it. Uh, it was a distortion, I think, of, uh, of the religion. It was a, an extreme version of it. But his followers, you know, basically operate on a premise that our mere existence is a threat to them. And they will never coexist with who we are and our values. Uh, and so the idea that somehow if we just changed who we were in some fashion or we didn't do certain, didn't engage in certain kinds of programs that they would just go away, they would leave us alone, I just think that's an illusion. Uh, it isn't to say we can't be smarter. It isn't to say that we shouldn't eliminate some of the mistakes we've made. But it is to say we're not the source of the problems. And the, and the reality in the Middle East is the Middle East isn't going to change until the peoples of the Middle East focus on themselves and assume responsibility and create a political culture of responsibility. There has been for a very long time a tendency to always blame their problems on someone else. It's always the outside world that's done it to them. And at a certain point, things aren't going to change until they decide they're going to change their societies, not because they're foreign conspiracies against them, but because they're assuming responsibility for themselves based on a set of principles uh, that will allow them to create societies that can live together that are not shaped entirely by uh, sectarian or clannish identities and when they when they get when that point is reached and that's what this what I call the Arab awakening the promise in the Arab awakening where people for the first time see themselves as citizens not as subjects and where they can make demands and where they can have a voice uh, and where they can have hopes and expectations and where they can create accountability that's the promise the problem today is there aren't, aren't institutions that allow them to act on that but what you saw in Egypt, in what they call the Second Revolution, what is different is people are not prepared to give up their voice. Now the question is, can they take that impulse and turn it into something that is constructive, positive, inclusive, uh, and guided by a sense of self-responsibility? If they do that, then this Arab awakening over time can in fact transform the Middle East for the better. We're a long ways from that. The hope is that they will do it. The danger is that you know the, the process of getting to that point will involve an awful lot of conflict within the region, and a lot of it won't be so easily contained. Thank you very much.